a cool uh, way to do it. Um, and uh, the one lesson besides the specifics of how to tilt the text that I'd like you to take from that is um, if there's something that you want to do via CSS about the appearance, even if we haven't covered it, it's possible that you might be able to do it. Um, you know how CSS works now, or at least you should have a pretty good idea of how CSS works now. So um, some Googling can point you in the right direction and um, sort of start with the assumption that you can probably do it and then uh, until you can't find any bit of information on it. Let me give you a for, for instance. Do you, and again, I guess the answer to this question is obvious the way that I phrased it, but do you think you can convert text to all capitals through your CSS alone? Yes, you can. All right. So I could, for example, make all my headings all capitals. I wouldn't have to make them all capitals in the document. I could type them in just the way I wanted to, but I could make them all capital letters. How do you do that? I don't know. I don't remember. I remember that you can do it. I know that that is sort of a logical thing that I might want to do. You know how like you capitalize titles, for example, if you write a paper and, and stuff like that. Um, but if I Googled CSS all capitals, there's a text transform property that allows you to go in and you can text, uh, uh, transform the text to uppercase, lowercase, or capitalize. So I go and do that. If I have the same text in these three paragraphs, all capitals, all small, and then capitalize, where it capitalizes the first letter of each word. So again, you can change to do that. That would be another way that maybe you could emphasize something. Uh, remember when we talked about color blindness? Um, we said that you can use color to emphasize something, but you should use something else. Well, that might be another way that you could do it by using all capitals. So again, try to see beyond the specific examples I'm giving and, and see that besides the stuff that we talk about in class, really it's wide open all the different things that you can do via CSS. At any rate, let me download the table example and talk about accessibility because I think that's the last topic we had as far as tables go. Alrighty. So the problem with tables from an accessibility perspective is that when a screen reader narrates the screen to someone, it quote linearizes the table. What does linearize mean? It means it, it, it reads it like a straight line of data. So if I were to turn the screen reader on, it would read average temperature, city, January, February, March, Cleveland, 15, 22, 32, Honolulu, 75, 82, and so on. With someone that can see, this data is viewed as being two-dimensional. And if I want to know what this 82 means, I can easily see that that relates to the February temperature for Honolulu simply by looking up and looking across. There needs to be a way to provide that functionality though for people that can't see. And there's a couple of ways to do it. All right. Probably the most straightforward way is with the scope attribute. With the scope attribute you define that a value is really a header for either a complete row or a complete column. 
So let me go and edit this. I didn't want to do that. So I can say that this has scope over a column. So this is a header for the entire column. And I can do that for each one of these fields. Now really, all right, if you want to think about it that way, Cleveland is sort of a header for this row. In other words, all these things are related to Cleveland. But you can't put a scope on a TD. So I have to make that a TH. And I don't say scope equals column. I say scope equals row. Now, this is one of those things like the Braille outside of the door here in the classroom. For someone that can see, this is going to have no impact whatsoever. It will only have an impact if you're accessing it via a screen reader. So the table is going to look identical. Well, it looks a little different now because I made that a TH. But uh, the table is going to look pretty much identical, but it's going to look um, uh, um, for, for someone accessing it with a screen reader, they'll be able to determine it. There's another way to do this. There's another way to do accessibility uh, for tables. And we'll look that up. And this is typically done with more complicated tables. It's a good article that talks about linearization, how it will read it as a straight line. Can you imagine if this is reading this table for you? By the time you got to be 15, read 15, what does that 15 mean? All right. So. Next. So use the scope for the simplest way is associate the data cells with the headers using the scope attribute. That's what we just reviewed. Another way to do it is using headers and IDs. Um, this is not generally recommended because the scope is usually sufficient for most tables. And what you do there is you define for each data cell what the header cells are using the ID. So you would put an ID on each TH and then you would say for this data cell, these are the IDs of the THs. But again, the scope is generally what's preferred. What are other things that you could do to make your table more accessible? One of the things, and we've talked about any number of these things, one of them is use a caption on it, right? The caption associates a meaning with the table. And it's part of the table, so the screen reader can rec recognize that. Um, and this article talks about all these things, actually. Um, don't use tables for layouts. All right. Like here's an example where they use, and we talked about that. Use the simplest table configuration possible. 
What do I mean by that? Let's say if I wanted to have a table that showed temperatures in the winter, spring, fall, and summer. I could do that like this and have city, January, February, and March. Then show the cities and the temperature. Then I could have another row of, uh, and I know you can't see this, I'm still writing. Um, I could have spring and show those. I could then have fall, or summer rather. I could do this and have one giant table that just alternated between TDs and THs. So I would have a header on the top for winter, and then I'd have all the different cities or average temperatures, and I could have a header for spring, all the cities, a header for summer, all the cities, a header for winter and all the cities. What would be another way to do this? Another way to do this. Well, another way to do this would be to just have four separate tables. Instead of having one giant table that had four sections, a section for winter, a section for spring, a section for summer, a section for fall, we could have one table for each season. So I would have then four tables with the header, city, January, February, March, then all the cities, then for April, May, and June, and all the cities, and so on. That is more accessible, all right? Because again, if you think about the way that it reads the table linearized, by the time you got to the temperature for Cleveland in May, it's hard for it to remember. Is that February? Is that May? Is that August? Or whatever. So if you break it down into three tables, or four tables actually, um, it's simpler. So make your table simple. All right. One thing that you can do with tables is you can combine rows and combine cells. That also makes the table more complicated. Um, so avoid doing those things. Keep your table simple. And again, if you remember, simplicity is a good characteristic for anyone, not just people with accessibility issues. So it's really a win-win situation. There's a couple of other tags that you can use. You can use a T head, a T body, and a T foot to go around the, the headers, the body, and the footer. And that's useful if you have, for example, totals at the bottom. So like maybe at the bottom of the table for the, the, the spring temperatures, I want an average of all the cities. Well, that's different than the other rows. So I would put that row in a T foot tag. I would put these in a T body tag. And I would put these in a T head tag. That's not absolutely required, but it gives you the ability to do that. Um, that helps make it a little more accessible. Plus, you have the advantage of styling. I could, for example, style the T header or, or the T foot section differently so people know that so people can easily tell that that represents you know totals or summary data for the entire table all right really for our purposes the main takeaways the main tags like for example for the tables that you're doing for this assignment hint hint all right and likely any tables that you'll include on your project You'll simply need the table tag, TRs, THs, TDs, 
and a caption. You also should have the scope attribute on the, t the headers to let the, let the um, browser know and let a screen reader know if the, something's a header for a column or for a row. Any questions about that? All right, we're going to do two more things today and then we'll get into our last topic next week. Because we're going to get into our last topic next week, um, I'm going to publish an a, uh, a announcement concerning like when everything is absolutely due because there are due dates, but um, like when the final absolute drop dead due date is for the assignments. I'll publish that within, you know, probably over the weekend. Um, but um, because we haven't talked about JavaScript much yet, you might have a hard time doing that assignment. Leave that one until last, and if you turn it in the week after next, um, sometime that will be okay. Uh, I'll put the exact date of it, all right, uh, that it will be due. But what I would like to do is talk a minute about publishing a website. What you need to publish a website, all right? Um, first of all, websites live on web servers. That's where finished websites live. So like for the websites that you're just developing for this class, the whole world can't access them, right? Just you can access them while they're being developed. But let's say your project is so good that you decide that you want to put it out on the web. What would you need? Well, first of all, you would need a machine that is running web server software. Now, you could make one of those machines yourself. You could install your machine and, and uh, install web server software on it, and you could have your own web server. But usually, people use a web hosting company. So a web hosting company is a place that runs the servers for you. And there's a lot of advantages of using a web hosting company rather than hosting it yourself. What do you suppose those advantages are? What's the advantage of using a web hosting company instead of? Because you can go and download a, the Apache web server for free, all right? And you're already connected to the internet, so you have an IP address, which we'll talk about in a minute, all right? Well, what's the advantage of using a web hosting company instead of? doing it yourself. Yes? Uh, security, security risks, less downtime. Security risks, less downtime. Anyone else? Yeah, I mean, look at it this way. That's their business, all right? So in other words, if there was a security issue with the web server software, it's their job to make sure their web servers are secure. So they're going to, they, they ought to be, if they're a good company, they ought to be on that. And any patches or install uh, uh, revisions to the web uh, server software, they're going to make sure they're applied. They're going to do backups for you. I mean, this is what you get when you pay for it, is someone takes care of that headache for you. Whereas, if you hosted your own website, all right, you'd have to be very vigilant. Uh, vigilant. 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 Why, why am I a mental block on that word today? You have to be very vigilant about making sure that your software is up to date. Web server software is pretty simple. All it does is it listens, it waits for requests of a certain kind that come in, and it responds with a web page. Again, the diagram I draw a lot in this and other classes is that you have a web server. You have the internet, rather. You have a web server, and clients connect to the web server and make a request, and the web server delivers the HTML pages to them. For the kind of pages we've been doing, that's what, how a web server would act, and that's how a web server would deliver. All right. Now again, with more involved web development, you actually have server-side scripting, where the web server runs a little program called a script and maybe interacts with a database 
and creates HTML that delivers. Now, how does a request get from here to there, and how does a request come back from there to here? Each computer on the internet has an IP address. An IP address uniquely identifies a particular computer. All right? So, requests are done via IP address. How do you get an IP address? Well, when you're connected to the internet, you have an IP address. All right? Now, there's two kinds of IP addresses, static and dynamic. All right? Static IP addresses stay the same. Dynamic IP addresses change every time you connect. So back in the old days, if you had a dial-up modem and you connected to the internet, you would get a different IP address today than you did yesterday. Even with DSLs and some of the other ones, it's possible to have dynamic IP addresses where you might not get the same uh, address more than once. Again, I'm a little fuzzy on exactly how, um, how those work with regards to IP addresses, but a static IP address is what you would need because people need to find your web page all the time, right? Your web page can't be moving around, all right? Well, it could, but if it moved around all the time, it would be impossible to find. Now, if you notice, we don't access our web pages by typing in an IP address, right? IP addresses look like this. There are four numbers between 0 and 256, 255, all right? Um, but when we go to Google, we don't type in a certain number. Believe it or not, we could, all right? But who can remember all those numbers, right? I don't remember a single phone number anymore, right? Because you store them all, all right? It's, it would be hard to remember all those numbers. And it would be hard to remember all those things. So what do you have instead? You have a name of a website. All right? So if I want Google, I type in Google.com. That's easier to remember. You know, uh, reminds me of Scott Pilgrim. What, what is the address for Amazon.ca? It's Amazon.ca. Am I the only one that watched that movie? All right. But anyhow. Go and watch it this weekend. It's, it's, a, it's a good movie. But um, we can remember that because, like, you know, once you remember some basic things, like what's the address for eBay? eBay.com. What's the address for Facebook? Facebook.com. It's really not that hard to remember those kind of things. So you have a name. So one of the things that if you're going to put make your website public, what you need to do is you need to register a domain. Now, there's one organization that registers the domains worldwide which makes sense, right? There, couldn't, there shouldn't be a Google.com in the United States and a different Google.com in Brazil or something like that, right? You should be confident that if you put in that domain that it's unique, that there's only one for it, and therefore one organization does that. Now, a number of organizations will help you register that, will do the, the grunt work for you. You know, it would be like sending someone down to the DMV for you to get your license plates, right? Boy, wouldn't that be great, right? But again, they charge you a certain amount and they will go and they will register the domain for you. So when you register a domain, what you do is you give what you want your website to be called. So CISS216.com, for example, all right? That could be our domain name. You then have to say what IP address that corresponds to. All right? So maybe my web hosting company, this is my IP address. And my domain name is CISS216.com. What will happen then is when I do that, when I register the domain and supply my IP address, Domain name service uh, uh, servers will get updated. DNS will get updated. And what the DNS is, is it's like a big phone book, all right? Except there's a bunch of DNS. There's a bunch of name servers, right? It would be like if you lived in a house with 
thousands of people and there was only one phone book, right? The DNS uh, servers are like the phone book of the internet. You want to go to a website, it looks up the IP address for you so that you can go to it. And to think if, um, what would happen if you were in like an apartment building and there was only one phone book for the whole apartment building? Well, you know, we would get backlogged, you know, with everyone trying to use it. What happens if someone broke in and stole the phone book or someone hacked the DNS server or whatever? So redundancies are built within the internet to, to keep it from being vulnerable to security attacks. So because of this, if I register a domain now, it might take a while to be able to access it. And by a while, I might mean up to a day or so. This is known as propagating the DNS servers. In other words, if I go and I register a domain today, and I tell my brother, go ahead and try to access the site, he might not be able to until later on today or maybe tomorrow. All right? Because these DNS servers update automatically, but it takes some time for the update to happen. Each of them update on a different schedule and blah, 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 and it goes from there. So what have I done so far? I've gotten a web hosting company that is running web server software. Web server software is software that can listen for requests for web pages and respond with web pages. I could do it myself, but I'm probably hiring a hosting company. All right. I register a domain. Domains expire. And it's important, especially if you're a business, but even with an individual, to make sure you don't let your domain expire. There was recently, I mean recently within the past six months, a case of someone letting their domain expire and something embarrassing happened to them. Does anyone know what that was? This happens a lot, but this particular case was, was politics. Jeb Bush let his domain expire and the Donald Trump uh, campaign purchased the domain and redirect and had it change it to redirect the Donald Trump site. So let's see if we can find that. All right, here's an article about it. Website with the domain jebbush.com redirects to the real estate mogul official campaign page. Features Trump's slogan, options to donate to his campaign. There are other embarrassing cases where people have let their domain expire and someone has bought it. There's actually a famous one where Google, believe it or not, slipped up and left their domain expire and someone bought it and then sold it back to them. They just did it to prove a point. Um, and, and they did it kind of as a joke. But in the hands of the wrong person, that could be deadly. All right. So you got to renew your domain every certain amount of time. Yes? Uh, what's the difference between uh, registering a domain and a uh, like host Like That's like a client for uh, like basically web services. OK. Yeah, HostGator would be like, um, yeah, or, or like GoDaddy or something like that. You can register a domain through GoDaddy or, or I use a, a, a company called Hosting Matters. What that is is that's like, that's like sending someone to the DMV for you, all right? Um, they may offer a deal on, on hosting that they'll register their domain for a certain amount. And in that way, you know, they're making up the, 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 the money with, uh, 
uh, by you know charging you a monthly fee to host your website. So that's just someone doing the paperwork for you essentially. And it just makes it easier. And it also makes it easier because then there's like one person to talk to. So you could register your own domain if you wanted to, but then you have to deal with the hosting company anyhow. So a lot of times you'll have the hosting company uh, that you host with register the domain for you and set up your web server and so on. Yeah, that would be yeah, that would be the most hassle way, hassle-free way to to go. For example, like my hosting company sends me reminders saying my domains are going to expire, so I don't have Donald Trump buying my domains and redirecting to his campaign or anything like that. All right. No, no. To register a domain depends where you go. I think GoDaddy does it for like five dollars for a year or something like that. So. And that's one, one good piece of advice for, for students would be to create an online portfolio of your stuff or create a, a site of your own. Um, the good thing about that is, is you can actually show employers, like even if you, you know, employers want to know that you can do the job, right? So how do you show someone to do the job if no one gives you a chance to do it? Well, you could always create a website that's a portfolio about yourself or for a club that you belong to or uh, a topic that you're interested in or whatever and you can show people hey I can create a website because I created this website you know if you're applying to be a nurse at a job you can't say gee I ran a clinic out of my living room for the past three years right I think people would frown upon that right However, if you are a web developer and you're looking for a job, you can say, I ran my own website for the past three years, and here it is. You can actually you know, give them a link, and they can see it for real. And that's a good way to show that you have the skills that you claim that you have. Right? In other jobs, how do you prove that, that? Well, unless you've done the job, it's kind of hard to prove that you have the skills. But web development is unique in that you can actually go and you can actually do the actual work, put it out there, and let people see it. So it's not expensive at all. Yes? So uh, kind of like how we've been doing uh, weeks, how we send uh, our homework assignments. Mm -hmm. Canvas, we zip everything up. Yes. And when we send those files to the host, the web server, we kind of compile them all in the phone and then we just send them to the chat. Um, you, it can happen a lot of ways. I haven't, I haven't really spoke about that yet, but that's an excellent point. So once you do, once you've done this, once you've hired your uh, um, hosting company, again register your domain, which is a certain small amount per year. You're typically going to charge. You're typically going to pay your hosting company so much a month, five, six dollars maybe. So again, you're talking about a year for sixty some dollars. Uh, the the price of a new video game for those of you that are so uh, so inclined. What you need to do then is. Get the stuff from your computer to the web server. All right? And that's done a couple of slightly different ways, but it would be very similar to uploading files like to the Dropbox. You log into your, the web server software. You have certain places where you can put the files. And then Either your web hosting company gives you sort of like a control panel, you know, which is like something similar to what you'd see in Canvas, what your options are to upload files and delete files and things like that, rename files. Or you can use a program called an FTP program. FTP stands for File Transfer Protocol. And you could use that to transfer pro uh, files from your computer up to the website. You could zip up and send them, but then they would need to be extracted on the other end, and you'd have to make sure you have the capabilities. Now, a couple more things about web hosting. Um, there is shared and dedicated web servers that you could get. A shared web server is where your website lives on a web server with other websites. You each have your own distinct domain name, so it's not like you're going to interfere with their website or anything. But the machine is sharing the load between you and other people. All right. 
which means that there could be performance issues. And if you had a real high volume website, you'd probably want a dedicated server. Some hosting companies have restrictions about how much can be downloaded, how, how many requests people can have, and how much data that they send down. For other programs, it's unlimited. All right. Um, if you're getting into more advanced web development things, you'd need to check to see what scripting language are supported. Typically, there are Apache web servers, which is the open source web server, and there are uh, Microsoft IIS web servers. Uh, Apache web servers run PHP and Perl and Ruby and those kinds of open source uh, software. Microsoft can do those as well, but Microsoft typically does .NET. So if you knew that you're going to develop a project in .NET, you'd have to make sure your web server supported it. All right. And then, simply by uploading your files, your website is live. All right. One thing that you have usually is you have defined a default web page. You know, notice when we type in www.google.com, we don't give the name of something.html. Well, the web server knows that when you type in google.com to pull up a certain page. Maybe it's called index.html or index.php. Those are typically the names that those are given. All right? Uh, or default.aspx. That's why I said for a lot of these assignments, name your home page index.html because that's by default typically what a lot of web servers are expecting. So that's sort of an overview of, of um, registering and, and installing a website. Um, it's not hard to do. It's a good experience to have, and I would encourage everyone uh, to try it. Again, it's, it's, it's pretty affordable to do that. Um, there may be some free hosting options out there. I know there used to be ages ago with GeoCities and, and things like that. Uh, I know GeoCities specifically is no longer with us, but um, some places offer some free web hosting. And typically what you get is you get ads then on your page, which, you know, um, not bad, but, you know, someone has to pick up the dime, right? All right, questions. Okay. Uh, I am going to call down and stop the recording, then I'm going to hand out the evaluation. I, uh...